But when you pick up one of my knives, I want it to, you know, I want you to connect with it. I, I don't want it just to be another one you pick up. Hey, that's okay. I want you to have a connection with it. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to another episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to episode number 49 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Glad that you are with us today. Got a great show coming up for you. Got a good interview with uh, Daryl Ralph coming up that we're going to chat about in just a second and hear from him. But pretty much as always, we have to talk about a new knife for the Knife Junkie. Well, um, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't keep up with the times. Um, so, you know, I've had uh, Epic Snuggle Bunny on the podcast a couple of times. And the mm -hmm. last time he was on, uh, it was specifically to talk about his efforts to reduce and refine his knife collection. I like the concept. Uh, it's, it's easier practiced in concept than in reality, but I, I like the idea as it spreads across my life. But I'm using my knife collection as, as the metaphor. Well, I've reduced a few, gotten rid of a, a few recently, but I, I dropped a little note in Epic Snuggle Bunny's DM on, on Instagram saying, uh, you mentioned uh, in a conversation that you wanted to get rid of the Crossroads at some point, and I wanted it. That's the Riot Crossroads designed by Kirby Lambert. And a couple of, uh, well, last week, he sent me a picture of it. Still interested? I said, <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, don't have to tease me anymore. Yeah, yeah. So I received it uh, this past Thursday, I believe, and it hasn't left my side. It is such a cool and beautiful knife. And it occurs to me... Uh, Epic Snuggle Bunnies, uh, Austin's Reduce is my refine because this is one, <laughs> now this is one of my one of the better knives in my collection. And uh, and so I, I assume he's moving onward and upward as as I am, too. So it's kind of the circle of life, Jim, you right. know, it, playing out right here on the Knife Junkie. It's so nice of you to help him reduce his collection, Bob. Well, you know, <laughs> that's part of, you know, being a good person is that's is, right. Is helping. Well, and if you uh, if you missed that episode, by the way, you can go to the knife dot com slash thirty five, the knife dot com slash three five and hear that uh, great interview with Epic Snuggle Bunny, as uh, Bob said, on the reduce and refine kick going on there. I was going to say, rest assured, uh, you will see a video this week, a collection selection video of this knife, this React Crossroads. It is. Um, well, I won't gush here. I'll gush in that video. It's <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, we gushed last week. We won't do that again this week. <laughs> hey, a little bit of knife news before we get into the uh, the interview. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very happy to see that Kershaw is upgrading their Emerson Design Collaboration knives. I'm not talking about the ZTs. I'm talking about the Emersons, uh, the inexpensive, the the most inexpensive uh, Emersons you can get your hands on, and they are spectacular knives. I've had a few. But they've always featured, as Nick Shabazz would say, the barely adequate or the barely inadequate 8CR13 MOV steel from China. Uh, they're replacing it with D2. And uh, I think they started on the um, CQCK4XL. Uh, yeah, I think that's what it is. <laughs> Where the do they big, come up with these abbreviations or names? It's the big four-incher that they make that looks uh, kind of like the uh, Emerson Gentleman. I think it's Gentleman Jim. So they came out with that in D2, and now I see they're coming out with the uh, CQC 4, I mean 6 and 7 too. Those are the popular Tanto, the first ones that came out, the Tanto mm -hmm. and, the, and the Clip Point. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy to see that. I personally love D2 Steel, and I know there is a, uh, a, a lot of um, debate as to some of the uh, sourcing of the D2 Steel uh, that's coming out of China, but phew, whatever. I, I can't get that deep in the weeds because there are mm. too many knives to get and to, <laughs> and to try. But, but uh, yeah, so Kershaw coming out with their Emersons in D2. It's a great move, I think, because they're great knives. And by the way, I was at a county fair yesterday and I saw a, uh, an Emerson in someone's pocket, an Emerson uh, Kershaw. I, mm -hmm. I, I look at people's pockets. It's kind of creepy there. But... Well, no, no, it's just the pocket <laughs> clips. Just when okay. I say pocket clips. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's clarify that. <laughs> yes. All right. A, um, a movie reference. You want to talk about a movie you watched last night, which actually kind of ties into our interview today? Well, a little bit, yeah. A little I, bit, yeah. I was up uh, late last night, couldn't sleep, and I turned on the TV, and The Revenant was on, the 2015 Alejandro Inarritu movie. Uh, it won an Oscar. 
or I, I'm sure it won several. It was an amazing movie. It was shot all with natural light, so it took them forever to make and out in the in the wilds. And at the end of this movie, it's a, it's about a roughly it's about a fur trapper looking for revenge for the death mm. of his son. Mm. And uh, the the battle between the uh, the the fight between Leonardo DiCaprio, the protagonist, and Tom Hardy, the antagonist, at the end of the movie is insane. It is so good. People should just check it out for that. It's a tomahawk and knife fight. Of course, I've never been in a tomahawk knife fight. <laughs> right. But if I were to be, this is what I would imagine it to be. It was sloppy. It was brutal. Uh, you know, they're already cold and half frozen and pumped up with adrenaline, you know, already stabbed a couple of times. And they're flopping around with their with their tomahawks in there and their knives. And I won't tell you who wins, but, uh, mm. you know, you can guess. But it is an amazing fight. Check it out. And it. And just watching um, and looking at the knives, this movie is incredibly accurate, as all Hollywood movies should be. They use these uh, Hud Hudson Bay knives. Uh, Condor Knife and Tool out of El Salvador makes a version uh, that I have of the Hudson Bay knife. It's kind of half chef's knife, half Bowie knife. And it was used by fur traders and trappers uh, in the you know early, uh, early 19th century and late 18th centuries. Uh, so those are the knives they use in this movie. And they are very cool and very mm -hmm. accurate and uh it just um well it kind of feeds into today because our our guest today right. daryl ralph also has a uh, a very cool movie that's featured i mean a very cool knife that's featured in a in a movie that i like uh the expendables Me too. Me too. <laughs> yes it's, how can you not like that it's like how a gathering of eagles all right. the best guys but uh if you haven't seen the revenant you gotta check it out and uh if you don't feel like checking it out check out the end if right, you like knives, you yeah. like the end. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a, a good lead in because, as you said, uh, movie knives play a, a part in the interview that we're about to hear. So, mm -hmm. what do you say we get into it? Let's do it. Ever strop a knife again, even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. I'm here with custom knife maker Daryl Ralph. He's also the head of DDR Knives, a small handmade knife outfit out of Texas. You might know him the way I know him from his uh, Expendables knife and then from some other famous knife situations I've seen online. Daryl, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast and welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Bob. I appreciate it. It's, it's an honor to be here. I wanted to tell you my first exposure to you was in the hand tech made, the HTM knives ads in the knife magazines. And I think I f the first design of yours uh, was the gun hammer uh, that I saw. And uh, I know later on, Kaiser took on that design and have done a bang up job with it. But, uh, so the gun hammer was the first thing that, wow, that really caught my eye. Who is this guy? And then the next time I really uh, keyed into you was that expendables knife. Uh, the scene where, um, where the guy's playing basketball, the, the bunch of jerks are playing basketball and, and Jason Statham shows up. And one of those basketball playing jerks had just uh, given his girlfriend a black eye. And so of course he, he kicks the guy's butt and he's about to, uh, uh, he has him on the ground and there's a basketball between them and they're looking at each other like two angry men who want to kill each other. And then uh, Jason Statham pulls out this giant, amazing, beautiful, uh, I believe it was tanto bladed knife and uh, pops the uh, pops the basketball and makes some sort of smarmy comment. And and I was like, where, what is that? What is that knife? I got to find that. And so I did some research online and I was like, oh, it's Daryl Ralph. So anyway, Daryl, that's my long way of getting around to saying I've, I've always kind of resonated with your designs. What's your uh, what's your approach? What angle do you do you come at uh, to knife making? Well, over the years, it's it's kind of changed, but I've always been a guy for um, uh, form and function first and then add the beauty. The knife has to work. The blade handle ratio has to be right. The purpose of the knife, the way it fits in your hand, all of those things have to be right before I add the, you know, the, the cosmetics, I, I call it. So basically the mechanics have got to be perfect before I can move forward, you know, in my purest mind of the way things are supposed to be, of course. Everybody has a, you know, a vision of how that works. But my approach is, is I just, uh, I come up with a concept and then um, I use SolidWorks nowadays uh and i build models of everything we do 100 percent, and then we we go right off the models they they work out really well when you say models are you talking about 3d cad models basically yes they're 3d okay. solid models of you know 
right hand, left hand uh, handles, uh, the lock bar, the lock inserts, all the screws, all the way it's all put together. Every every detail is there. And we actually cut our CADs right from – all of our CAD work is done right from those solids nowadays. So were you, uh, were you at one time a, a pencil and paper guy and then at some point saw the, um, saw the value of CAD? Yes, uh, pencil and paper was first, and then uh, I've always been a uh, CNC guy uh, since I was a kid. Uh, applications engin- engineering uh, and uh, CNC uh, machining has been basically my whole life since I was 24. Wow. I uh, went to school, I think eight schools for my education. I had some real good uh my teachers the guys that brought me up were just they were phenomenal uh i was very lucky uh they were also hardcore so you know mistakes were not allowed <laughs> they, they held your feet to the fire and made sure you were doing it exactly. oh man oh it was it was a that was a terrific time because the guys that i trained today i still train all my own folks and uh it just we used to have to be able to do everything in our head, Bob. Mm-hmm. I mean, we'd have to do geometry and trigonometry in our head. And that's, oh I swear to goodness, that's the way it was. These guys today, you know, not saying anything, but, you know, they've been taught not to do that. They just, they don't know how to count in their head. They can't subtract and add. So we have to find other ways to do it. And then I make them do it. I don't make them, but I try to bring them into that fold and have them understand that you're going to get a lot better if you can do that. Uh, you know, it's something that's required when you're reading code that no one knows what it is. You've got to be able to read that code. You've got to be able to add and subtract numbers. You know, the trigonometry, I, you know, I can give you a break on that, but add <laughs> the tracking. Come on, man. <laughs> oh my gosh. They, so you're, you're nice enough to give them a break on the trigonometry. I, I, I would just hammer it through, man. I do. I try to, uh, you know, I give them the little, little, little things, you know, like, uh, one degree at uh, uh, one inch equals so many thousands at the other side so that they understand that, oh, if you do that four times, then it's four times as many, you know, and they, it's gets better. You know, as you go, it gets better. Well, how many how many guys do you have in your shop? Right now we have, uh, including myself, we have five people. Wow. You, your output is amazing for five people. Judging by your Instagram posts, you're, you are constantly pumping out product. It's amazing that you do that with only five people. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. Yeah. We work hard at it. So you came to knives. What about knives? Is it the weapon aspect? Is it the tool aspect? Is it both? Um, you know, what, what do you, what do you see your knives being used for and, and, uh, and that kind of thing? I like a tool that everybody can carry, but, uh, and, I carry basically a Dominator knife all the time, and I use it for everything, including uh, hunting, fishing, cutting rope. Uh, I use it when I camp. I, I use it all the time. I mean, that's just my knife. I guess my heritage is where it all comes from. I'm, I'm Viking, oh, Norseman, wow. and uh, my clan invaded Ireland. And so... Kind of got a little bit of both of those. And, um, and I think that, that that's where the weapons aspect comes from. I, I really do. I believe that it's kind of like in my soul or something. Uh, I, I can't, I can't put my finger on it, but, um, I also want, when you pick up one of my knives, I want it to, you know, I want you to connect with it. I, I don't want it just to be another one you pick up. Hey, that's okay. I want you to have a connection with it. I guess that's where it all comes from. Just the belief in it and not stopping until I'm happy with it. You know? Well, it's interesting that you mention having a connection. Uh, two things come to mind immediately. Uh, first is that each knife uh, that I see, uh, you know, that you post on Instagram, for instance, or that I see on your website, each one looks unique. Obviously, you might have two dominators that they're the same model, but other than them being the same basic format, they look very different. Each one looks unique and and toiled over uh, artistically, and and then also that that personal connection. Uh, I forgot to mention earlier another way that you came to the fore in my mind recently has been through uh, CM. You know, I was a big fan of his and his videos, 
And I understand uh, CMFTW. He he had uh, Matt Freeman. Yeah. Uh, he um, for everyone else. <laughs> he had a couple of your knives, and they were very special to him. I know uh, one of them. Uh, I believe was an was an AXD uh, that had some inscriptions in it, and it was a it. You know, he had some years ticked off on that for some goals he was setting, and uh, I thought that was amazing. And and he mentioned in the videos that he worked closely with you to to kind of come up with that. Yeah, that was a true that was a true fact. Um, Charlie Mike or Matt Freeman, whichever one you want to call him, he was a hero. He would call me from the sandbox back in the early two thousands uh, on satellite, and he would call me, and we would sit down, and I. Uh, I would send him over, uh, I used to make uh, a knife for the Special Forces and for the Navy pilots. It was called the 18 X-Ray, and it was a switchblade for the government. It had all kinds of um, requirements so that it, it met many tests and all that. We used to send those over to Matt and some other fellows like uh, Jim Patrick and his crew. They were a Black Hawk helicopter crew. Mm. and FBI guys and stuff like that. But Matt would call me on the on the satellite phone, and we would sit and talk for his whole time that he had. Wow. And it was just uh, about this and that. You know what? It was just, I think it was just comforting. And I don't even know how in the world we got hooked up. I don't remember. It was an ad <laughs> or something. I left a phone number, there and he just called up. And, and years went by, and Matt come back, and he was a tortured soul. and. Um, he went, he did some pretty crazy things. Uh, but I also noticed, uh, I, I connected with his genius. He, he was, he had a drive inside of him that had to be, uh, addressed, uh, as for making knives. And then that didn't come out until, you know, the last 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, I, I really respected Matt. Uh, he did a lot of things in his life. Uh, he was American hero. That's number one. He came back and he had, uh, he had all of the nasty things that vets come back with, you know, paranoia and the, the thrill is gone. There's no more every day. You don't have to get up and worry about being shot anymore. So when you come back here, you're just, uh, a calm, normal, everyday person. And that thrill is gone. That pressure is gone. And people don't understand that there's, once you get used to that, you've got to have it. Mm. So it's almost like an addiction. So some guys cover it up by self-medicating and doing just outrageous things. Matt did a lot of that. And we talked a lot of times when at three in the morning, he was not in good shape. And um, I just tried to be a good person and, you know, understand that you won't, you can, you have, you can love the good parts about someone and, and despise the other parts, but you got to love them for who they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just had a connection and Matt got finally, he got clean for a couple of years and he bought the, uh, a couple of AXDs with his uh, his time and, and you know his AA uh, mantras and signals and uh, all of the insignias and everything he bought them so that he could carry them every day to remind himself of who he is and where he's going. I made several knives uh, in that vein for him, and then one day he just called me up and said I've started making knives, and I was just I was floored, but. He started out very rudimentary and he just, he, he advanced to where he had a crowd of people following him for his, he just loved to make a good knife. I mean, he was very, very pure about it too. You know, he was awesome. Yeah. And I loved how, uh, I loved how he was devoted to the chisel grind. And then oh, he, yeah. he made a great <laughs> video illustrating on a piece of leather, how damaging uh, a chisel grind can be i mean and, and he was speaking purely in the tactical sense i mean i've i've been long a fan of chisel blades uh but also uh you know realizing how sharp they are but also kind of wondering why people still did it in a way and then he cleared it up i i uh yeah i respected him a lot and his knives towards the end were amazing he he, he had a big following you know people wanted everything he was doing it was fantastic you know and he he really cared about it you know, that's what I loved. If, if, if a knife didn't work out, he treat wise, it broke. He threw it, threw it in the other, in the corner, you know, and started mm -hmm. over. That's, that's, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, that's awesome. I mean, so many, so many knife makers don't do that kind of thing anymore nowadays. Uh, 
it was very collectible knives in my opinion because they really were truly one off. I don't care if you made right. ten of them; they were this none of them the same. Yeah, and yeah. he was just he was just a phenomenal person. He was also mentoring uh, another person also in his shop. A woman, a woman knife maker, which yes. is a yeah. refreshing detail. Miko. Yeah, Miko. Yeah. And his mother, by the way, folks, uh, his mother, they're still uh, grabbing all his uh, knives. They're going out. They're trying to find homes for him. Really? So somebody goes, gets out there. Yeah, just recently they auctioned one off. Uh, they're auctioning them off one at a time. All the proceeds go to his mother. His mother was his heart. He loved his mom. And she took care of him when he was not well and uh you know like a good mom does and uh so they're auctioning them off make sure they go to good places and they're, they're his actual carry knives so wow. I, I thought that was very very awesome you know? yeah well and and he towards the end was getting into Kali, which i love and uh your your knives are um i mean especially the axd in in my eyes personally perfect for that for that kind of, you know, knife fighting system. Tell me a little bit about the Expendables knife. I, mean, I, I mentioned that before. How did that get in that movie? Is that something that you knew was going to happen? I know sometimes people are blindsided. Oh, my God, that's my knife in that movie. Did was this? How did that work out for you? Well, I believe in divine intervention, and I, I'm a very spiritual person. Uh, I believe in God. I believe in uh, I'm a Christian. I believe it was divine intervention. Uh, I had made knives for uh, Stallone through uh, knife art. Uh, I would make knives and Stallone would look at my knives. He would buy that knife. His wife would buy the knife. He'd say, buy that knife and they'd get the knife. He's got a room, from what I understand, with a huge collection of knives in it. And when they were making the movie, from what I understand, Jason Statham, he told Jason Statham, go in the room, pick whatever knife you want. We'll use it in that scene. Oh, God. So cool. Okay. So that, I just call that divine intervention. I don't know what else to call it. It was just um, right place, right time. Yeah, yeah. But but it wasn't you in the right place at the right time. It was your work, which is in a way even better because it sells itself. You're not there like, oh, you should use it because of this and that. It's there. The guy resonated with it. And I also have heard that Stallone has a massive knife collection. And for him to walk into a knife room and go right to your knife, that that says something. Oh, uh, so it was, I was, it was such a great honor. Uh, I, people were calling me up saying, do you see that knife? And I, it, what knife? <laughs> so I, I didn't even know what they were doing. It was funny. Uh, very, it was hilarious actually. Well, so when Hollywood does that, and I'm just going to use Hollywood as a loose term, do they contact you after the fact? Or is it just like them using a, uh, a 1911, you know, they're, they're not going to call Colt and say like, Hey, we used one of your guns in our movie. Do they extend that courtesy or? Nope, they just used it, uh, put it in the movie, and then what we actually seen was not the knife, it was rubber. Oh. What they do is they make rubber molds of every one of them for safety. <laughs> uh, and the, the last stroke that I heard on it was that the there's an auction house that auctions off movie props, and I guess they auctioned it off maybe about four years ago. And uh, that went out to auction. And I guess all of the uh, proceeds went to the military. Stallone do donated all them to the uh, military. That's the right thing to do. Yeah, I think so. So when did you get into like making flippers? I I I'm assuming, and maybe this isn't the right thing for me to do, but I'm assuming you started like many do uh, with fixed blades. But it seems that you really made your name with flippers. Did did you start with fixed blades before I make that assumption? I did. Um, I started with cord wrap tantos and drop points and i would take them to a show in cincinnati ohio it was a basically a pocket knife jack knife show is what i called it and they had all the cases and bucks and camillas and all of those companies trade you know and that's what that whole show was about but the grandpa knives <laughs> it was grandpa knives yeah it yeah. was and uh but along with that there was a new wave of uh custom knives coming in that were very unique for that time frame. And um, so I'd go down there and set up. I set up down there maybe four or five times, I think, all together. And it surprised me. I'd go down there and set up and, you know, I come back and all my knives were gone. And I was like, wow, there's something to this. <laughs> yeah. Then I, then I started forging uh, Damascus with Tim Zawada, very famous knife maker that's kind of like 
underrated, I guess. He he won so many Master Smiths and awards at the Blade Show. He just quit going. <laughs> let, let the other guys have a chance. He's great. He was great at it. So I, he lived in Michigan, and I, I would run up there, and he, he showed me how to make Damascus. So I started making my own Damascus. Then I went into switchblades for about eight or nine years. That's all we did is make switchblades with gold inlays and, and, and diamonds and ivories and pearls and Damascus. It was all hand forged. And, you know, that's what the time frame, you know, required at that time. That's what was very, very popular. Right after the jack knife, the, uh, the inner frame phase, came a two phases then it was like uh the beginning of the tactical phase and the switchblades got extremely hot i mean they were going for huge money just crazy uh bill mchenry and mm. some of those guys you probably never even heard of anymore but they were out there just making stuff that was just phenomenal they were carving in you know thor in the sides of uh damascus and uh just doing crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. So I, I kind of lived in that realm for a little while, but uh, it all come back to my CNC training and all that for all these years. And I, I love robotics. I don't know what it is about it, but I started making tactical knives in probably 96. i uh, come out with a knife called the Krite. Uh, and it was, I come out with that with uh, Les Robertson. And we sold quite a few of them and they were titanium folder with, uh, back then they called it, uh, uh, I can't remember, but it, now it's, it's, uh, S 90 V back then oh. they called it 420 V and they got rid of that name because it was too close to 420 <laughs> jackknife steel. Yeah. 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 But it was, it was tough stuff back then, you know, and we were doing uh, black coatings and, you know, doing PVD and everything back in the nineties. And I made switch blades out of those also. So that evolved into basically, uh, making a flipper with bearings in it that I did on a patent in 2005. Uh, for a uh, flipper with bearings with a washer instead of writing on titanium, instead of the bearings write on titanium as they do in some knives. So it's like a race, uh, like a metal uh, steel race that the... That the yes. Um, okay. What I do is put a pocket in it and then I put two steel washers, then the bearings, and oh, then yeah. onto the blade. So everything is uh, hardened steel on hardened steel. Right. Some folks were running them on the titanium at that time and what would happen over time, they would wear... Even if you use compression and put a groove in there and get a wear point going, it doesn't matter. Still, only a certain amount of hardness involved there on the titanium. And what I found out after I put, tried that with butterfly knives, which was another one of my passions, uh, my bearing setups would just go to pieces. They wouldn't last. So I decided to put a steel washer in there, and then that took care of all that. And then now everybody uses that. Uh, it was a, a provisional patent for one year. Uh, in 05 and that's kind of like the norm now and uh, I, I just love the bearing flippers I mean it's like having a, I, I also with a, I forgot one step there with Camillus um, I helped them develop their assisted opening system also there was three or four different trains of thought at that time there's Ken Onion who was the king of course with uh, Kershaw uh, but we had bar. Yes, we had a different, uh, whole different setup that, oh, they went back and forth at each other like, uh, like all good warriors do. And it ended up that, uh, the Camillus was allowed to make them too and all that. So, man, we just, we just burned the mark on up. Ours was like a, was done like an Italian switchblade spring instead of like a coil spring. It was actually a, a spring bar like uh, the um, Italian switchblades have. Right. Man, it was something else. That thing would pie out there, and they, they just worked really, really well. And that was a pre precursor to the bearing flipper, actually. And once we figured out, you know, we could do the bearing flippers and have the same kind of effect, you know, that's kind of been the norm since then. I've heard the argument that assisted opening um, systems now – being made now, you know, now, now that uh, ball bearings are kind of uh, much more pedestrian or or available uh, at much lower cost, that using um, that companies like Kershaw who put out, I don't know, several thousand models a year, uh, and a lot of them are uh, assisted open, that using that now allows for a lot of slop in the manufacturing process, or at least in the in the action. Would you agree with that, or is that just kind of haters hating? Um. I don't look at it that way. I think that everything has a step on the ladder. Mm -hmm. 
okay, for us to get to the bearing, we had to go through that step. We had to go through the phosphorus bronze washer step. We had to go through the nylon strap, uh, step. We had to go uh, washer step where, oh, those open great, but they don't, the blades don't, you know, the nylon is, or Teflon is not tough enough to keep the blade in the center, that kind of thing. There was a lot of things that happened back then that folks don't really realize because so many guys come into the industry when they're 20 years old and they don't understand what the history was, you know, to get there. Uh, we come from a slip joint or, you know, your, your, my grandpa's, uh, uh, yellow jacket, uh, case knife that you opened up and it was bang, bang, two, 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 two hits. Uh, and there was no way to open it with one hand or anything like that to a one hander to assisted opening to bearing open to, you know, uh, I even know a guy that used to put motors in them and open them. Uh, oh. Karen, Paul, uh, he used to put a motor in, in the pivot and, and have them open that way. And that was his big deal. But, uh, you know, I mean, we've come a long, long way in this industry. When I looked at my first jackknife, I said, man, what is wrong with these people? <laughs> no, no offense, but man, the blade handle ratios were, uh, that, that one buck knife was so famous, but had a little was skinny a blade. Buck 110. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, the buck 110, take a look at a buck 110 and look at what we're carrying today. I mean, come on, guys. Think about how many, how many evolutions there are to get to that point. And, and so many things get dropped. But as for the precision, um, we actually made a ball bearing assisted opener hmm. pivot. And it opens so phenomenal, it was, but there's no real sense in it because the ball bearings are so, you know, the bearings open the pivot pretty, pretty sweet. You don't have to do that. But we made a few of them just to say we did. And man, they opened like a rocket right. and they were very, very highly precise. But the Kershaw thing and all that stuff. No, it's not very precise. Those pivots are not the same as what we're using now. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're about a step backward. And, but. You know they're still very popular, and you got to look at the the eighty percenters out there that buy knives from uh you know ten dollars to a hundred bucks. That's what you're going to get, and if it's working for them and they're happy, that's the way it should be. Oh yeah, yeah, and they have a a huge clientele who who are you know buying knives who are not knife people. They just need a need a damn knife. They go to Walmart and they buy one. Yeah. And Absolutely. the action is great and the designs are great and the, the feel is, is excellent. And some people really don't need anything more or desire anything more than a $17 knife. And for that, man, well, I mean, Kershaw, I, I, I like their stuff from soup to nuts, but, uh, yeah, but I mean, they're fantastic. I mean, they, they definitely offer a, a, a great uh, value, you know, to that end of the market. Yeah, they do. They're very good at that. That's uh, one of their fortes. So you were talking about, um, forging your own Damascus. And, and I happen to be looking right now at a, at a, uh, at a dominator that you posted somewhat recently. Uh, it's a, a Tanto in Damascus and it's got an incredible Mokume handle. And uh, well, I, I guess I have two, two reactions. The first is a question is, are you still forging all your Damascus? Can, is that something you can, do you have the bandwidth to, to do that? A and B, the materials you use are so, I mean, some of your knives are so opulent and gorgeous and and really um labored over you can tell and yet they are these bullishly strong functional uh, uh tools so it's kind of a an interesting dichotomy um <laughs> any thoughts on what i just yammered out do you make your own damascus still no not anymore i leave that to the experts uh i buy uh several types of Damascus, and I'm not saying one guy does a better job than the other. Uh, my favorite, though, is Chad Nichols, and there's a good reason for that. When Chad was coming up and just starting to make Damascus, him and I talked. I had been doing it for 10 years, and him and I talked, and I he would do things at that time that I asked him to do for me. Mm -hmm. uh, he had the time to do that. He doesn't have the time to do that anymore. That Mokame you're seeing right there on that thing is a favor. Ah. Uh, I waited for it. I said, I don't want anybody else's. I want yours. Uh, him and Mike Sackmeyer make the best as far as I'm concerned on the Mokame. Uh, but Chad did some things to that Mokame for me that I wanted. That black stripe you see in there is from his making mine with a little bit more nickel silver in it. And then I could, uh, when we patinaed that nickel silver, it turns black. 
or I'm sorry, copper. He put copper and nickel silver in mine uh, on a higher level than he did the brass. And then the copper turns black and the nickel silver is uh, silver. And then the brass is that goldish color. Wow. And that, that combination looks like a Bengal tiger kind of look to yeah. me. And then when he does that, that pattern, it just kind of looks like a animal skin almost. But as for me uh, dem uh, doing Damascus in no. Uh, I quit, I think, in about in the year 2001. And my it got so busy I couldn't do it anymore. It's a labor of love when you do um, – you know, I was doing it in a garage, and I had uh, a, a mill and a surface grinder, and I would be milling and surface grinding a bar 10 times before it was done. It was just not – it was not, it was no profit in it. It was labor of love. I love it. And I still do. And, but I, I just can't do that anymore. It's just, uh, it's not that I can't do it. I don't do it. It's just, there's, I, I've got to make a living. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like a truly artistic pursuit. It, it really is. It, it, unless you want to do what Chad has done, where he's set up uh, making stainless uh, damask on a pr production type basis. Right. And right. he's done, done well at it. He does a good job. And, I can count on everything that he makes and that's, that's why I like it. There's no, I don't have any, um, uh, aha moments mm -hmm. per, per se. And he makes some very nice pattern, you know, and in, in a stainless and I want my, my customers to have stainless Damascus if possible, uh, unless there's something unique that they want. I do have some bars, Bob, uh, I've got five bars of, these huge twists that I made before I quit and uh, they've been sitting in my storage room and we've threatened to cut them several <laughs> times. One of these days we will. I think they're uh, all uh, high nickel uh, uh, carbon Damascus and they'll turn out just like them. I'll have them, I'll gun blow them and they'll just look like, uh, oh, those are, those are the ones that used to really kill me because I love that contrast. So you gotta, you gotta hold on to those till the moment is, is right. Yeah, but if I don't do it pretty soon, you know, they may they may just disappear with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like a, that was like eighteen years ago. So oh, wow. I got to get on the ball and get them done. Uh, we've got a wire now, so you know, I can actually wire them out and get them wire EDM them, uh, yeah. cut that center patch out and uh, make daggers out of it and you know, stuff oh, like that. Yes, I I concur wholeheartedly. A dagger a dagger should be coming next. I saw a picture of a of an AXD with a dagger blade. Yes, and, and it. I swear, in the picture, it looked like the back edge, the top edge was sharp, but it didn't look like it could actually fit in the handle. So, like you know, completely fit in the handle so that the hand wouldn't be cut. So, yeah, yeah. But that was I'm a trick. <laughs> no, okay, trick of the. Uh, so, uh, the Moab, the Moab, this giant, oh, yeah, yeah, this giant cleaver shaped blade. So I saw one uh, that you produced uh, an XL version. I don't know if you do that. I don't know if that was a one off or not. But uh, in your post, you said that someone drove all the way from California to Blade Show, I think, in Atlanta to pick yes. it up. Yes. Yeah. He flew in. He actually flew in to get it. Flew in. Flew Just in. that knife. And then he flew back, uh, from what I understand. I mean, that thing, to me, represents, uh, I mean, I look at that and I can tell this is a man who loves, loves, loves working with materials, like really high-end and exotic materials. Was that a special order? Is that something that you love to do? And and uh, just kind of produced that and found a, a buyer? How, did, how does that work? That was a spec order. Oh. One thing is, you know, I'm an old guy now and, you know, OG, original gangster. <laughs> and uh, that's what they call me. And uh, But they really mean old guy. But, uh, <laughs> they, uh, the, 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 uh, the people that I have, uh, the associates I have working uh, here now, I, I actually, we're more like a family. but. Uh, the thing that I like about them, they're young and mm. I train them. I try to train every one of them. And I also dig in their creative young minds and we try to come up with new things and push ourselves, uh, and keep pushing. Uh, I know, I just don't th you know, you can make this a Benzo type knife. Uh, and you know, I gotta say, God bless, uh, uh, Chris Reeve fantastic guy you know you come up with the uh the frame lock all that kind of thing at least as far as i know and what i've been told right. uh, i don't want to put no fingers on that but um chris reeve makes one tank of a knife and it's just got it's an iconic knife 
I want to make tanks. That's what the Dominator was. It's a tank with bearings. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to be able to add beauty to it. But these young guys, you know, we, we make a knife and then we think about what could we do to make that better. And we sat around and we talk about it a little bit and let's say, all right, we're going to do it. And, and that's the way it basically falls together. I mean, we, we don't sit down and make a drawing of it different or anything like that. You know, it's more like a vision. And I, I've got some very talented people. I, I'm just very lucky in that respect. They, they, they want to be knife makers. They're not uh -huh. people you just want to come and do a job. Hmm. They all love what they do. One of them it forges his own blades. One of them makes knives, too. Oh. On the side, uh, one of them is just, he's just a very, very smart young man that is very good at assembly and fit and finish and, and that such. And then I have another guy that is just the nitpicker. <laughs> you need one. Well, he builds all of our pins. And then when a knife is done, it goes to him because he puts the laser etching on it. And if it's not right, uh, he goes right to Kevin, the shop supervisor, and they say, oh, that's not going anywhere. And we go backwards and we make it right, make it perfect, and then it goes out. So I have I, I have a, a, a very good firewall set up nowadays. And I, I, I like I said, the creativity just it just these these guys have got it in their brain. They get it, you know, and, and, and I don't know how that happened actually. Uh, um went through some people uh a few years back, had some issues here with some uh bad blood and things and so i just wiped everything out and started over hmm. and that's how we've got to this point now which i think it's the best we've ever been in 30 years it doesn't surprise me because um uh, I, yeah i come from a very collaborative but creative uh, field and really i benefit greatly from having talented people around me who know things that i don't know and who come come at it from perspectives that i couldn't possibly come at it from and it's made me better at what I do. So, I mean, are you are you saying that you're better as a you're better? You've become a better knife maker now that you collaborate and, and get other people's ideas and incorporate them into yours. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt about it. You know, the old saying is, is, uh, you know, if you're around somebody better than you, you're going to be that's the next level. You yeah. know, you reach, you, 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 you play off of each other, you know, and also it gives me goals to make myself better. I throw stuff out at these guys and I say, look, what do you think about this? And, you know, in a week we've got ideas that we can do this, we can do that, we can do this, we can do that, you know, and it's just fantastic. Uh, it's like our mirror polishing blades, you know, that's an old art. It's been around a long, long time, you know, way, way back in the seventies, eighties, uh, 70s and 80s, that was very popular. With 440C and ATS-34, they were mere polishing blades on, you know, the uh, inner frame jackknives and, you know, uh, Ron Lake, all them guys, Bus, Bussy and all them guys. Mm -hmm. They were they were actually mere polishing a lot of blades. Uh, and some of the uh, Bob Loveless mere polished all those big bears and all those fighters and all mm -hmm. that at that time. And it kind of died in the nineties and now it's being revived again. We're starting to see it starting to roll again because really, when you think about it, if you're going to collect a knife, you know, that's like the crow picking up something shiny. It really <laughs> is. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. it's beautiful. If you do it right. And now the technology we have is so better than we had before. We have diamond compounds now where we can get sharp lines on mere polished blades that are like cutting edges on the, where the grinds meet the flat, you know, mm. Before they rounded over because they did a lot of buffing, right, right, high end buffing, and they were rounded a little bit. You know, now you look at them, you can get sharp lines because of the the uh, compounds that are out there that we can take them almost to a mirror polish with a, a diamond compound and a belt, and it's just amazing. So, are you getting a lot of orders now uh, for polished blades on on your custom orders? Uh, we do. We get uh, a lot of mirror polish, especially on butterfly knives. Uh, oh. Guys that buy butterflies oh. want want uh, mirror polish blades. They really do. Because of the flash when it moves, probably. Sorry. For yeah, that. yeah. Well, that big Moab, you know, once we did a mirror polish on one of those, man, that was just like, oh, my goodness. That opened up a door. There was people behind that door we didn't know were there. And <laughs> thank you for the kind comments about that knife, uh, by the way. That's I got to say there was a knife out there by a company called Rad, R-A-D Knives, and uh, he kind of brought that whole genre in. And I think there were some people that had uh, ideas similar to that but were 
different enough that uh, I think that, you know, uh, everybody has their own t- uh, take on things. And sometimes yeah. you just get a, you know, I like that so much, you know, it's like having a, uh, uh, a Lexus and you look over and there's a, a Honda that looks exactly like it, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's just, that's just the way life works. Yeah. You see something so many times, you know, sometimes you've just got to throw it out of your brain, you know, and get it out there. That's the zeitgeist. Ideas are out in the ether, you know, and I mean, I. It's like uh, for a while there, Warren Cliffs were were suddenly like, oh my gosh, they were like rediscovered, and and you as a as a Viking, I'm sure appreciate that, but but that whole sax shaped blade, and then and then that sort of, I think it was with Rad Knives. I mean, I think I'm observing the same thing. It sort of um, evolved or just you know uh, uh, changed into sort of a cleaver blade, and then and then. Everybody, you know, Rad Knives was, I was seeing them posted everywhere from my favorite collectors on Instagram. And then I started noticing, you know, Sheepdog Knives and all these other big, chunky cleaver blades coming out. And they're very appealing to me aesthetically. I'm not exactly sure how I would use them. I mean, I collect and I carry, but, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not out there camping a lot and uh, I'm certainly not getting the knife fights. So I always wondered kind of what the value would be for me to have a big cleaver blade. Yeah. I sent one to the fellow I mentioned before, along with Charlie Mike. His name is Jim Patrick. He was a Black Hawk helicopter pilot, master chief. And he, I sent him over one because he wanted one. I, I try to treat vets with the utmost respect. And sometimes I just do things that most people think I'm insane for doing. I just sent him one. I said, here you go, Jim. Cool. He's a good man. He comes to the Blade Show. He he fought for our country. You know, he had the same kind of things that that uh, Charlie and Mike had when he come back. You know, he he went through five years of hell, and you know, and he was over there rescuing and saving our lives. He's a hero. So Absolutely. I never have uh, any hesitation when he needs something. I always try to help him. He sent me flags back from over there and. Stuff like that because I'd send over 18 X-rays to his crew, so they would all be safe and have the the latest and greatest switch blades and all that stuff. But uh, I sent one to him, and you know he had the same kind of a uh, take on it that you do, Bob. Is it was, you know, what in the saying heck am I going to do with this thing? But you know, I did, I carried a smaller version of it for a while, and I'll tell you, it does work out nice with that that nice flat blade and then the right on the tip you can go right through a lot of things with it but as for being a functional tool eh, every day uh i'll take a bowie any day so oh, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> most sold blade in the world is a is a drop point buoy or whatever you want to call them you know? yeah but that tip that tip on a Warncliffe, uh especially i mean the way you have it set up on the moab looks very slashy i mean i, I think Ooh, yes. pe- people are people you know there, there's great value in the recurve in terms of like really cutting deep in a slash but the tip of a Warncliffe or of, of, of like this moab i'm looking at right now that really i mean because i'll i'll just test down free hanging t-shirts and free hanging fabric just when i'm you know just to just to see what blade shape works best and and for me it's been my warn my warnies that i was going to mention the, the brands but you know it doesn't really matter but they work the best and then, they and then, do. They do. Know, just, just in a just in a slash on material that's not held down or anything, it's just really. So, I mean, I understand. I would I would use it for that and and other things. Well, being a Texan, I have tried them on brisket. Oh, they work great on brisket. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wanted to get to a couple more things. Um, hand tech made HTM. I mentioned them at the, at the outset. Who are they? And I've I've heard things about them. Can you tell me about HTM? Was that your company mm-hmm. or? Okay. HTM came into, okay, I, I always wanted an American made affordable knife. Uh, back around 2007, 2006, I was developing that in my brain and, um, I was rolling around how I could do it and make it work. Uh, you know, it's kind of a, a big order at that time for me and I'm mean, a tall order. And then the economy crashed in 2008. Well, my thoughts at that time was if I'm going to stay in business, I need to have knives between 100 and 500 $500 or you know, for the folks that used to be able to buy a $1000 knife, now they can afford something in that ballpark plus the other folks on the high end were still there and everything was fine, but boy, that 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 genre disappeared. 
uh, from five hundred to fifteen hundred dollar knives disappeared. It was gone. Mm-hmm. So that's where uh, Hand Tech Made came from. I started it, and I started with I made uh, some aluminum dominators at that time. Uh, oh well, they were carbon fiber. Let me think. Where G10? They were G10, and they had uh, fluting going across the handles and S30V blades. I was trying to come up with a way to make a knife that we could sell between those two price points. A couple of little fixed blades. Those um, that was the the it was called a Max Q at that time. Uh, that was where it all started and went from. Then I was hooked up with a company here in Dallas called uh, BNF Systems. They own huge distribution. Uh, for uh, grocery store items and uh, catalogs, they have uh, they have kitchen knives. They have all kinds of stuff in that. It's like a, a distributor catalog or, or something of that sort. And they owned a company called Myerco. When Camillus closed, I grabbed my national stock number for the 18 X-ray and I licensed it to uh, John Meyer at Myerco, and we made those military knives. Because we had orders, we had crazy amount of orders for you know thousands and thousands of switchblades, but we didn't have anywhere to make them anymore because Camillus closed their doors. So that's where that started. And then what we did was, is uh, John and a fellow named Mike Manrose uh, decided that they would try to do an American-made knife, and basically uh, HTM kind of evolved into that. And I was not even an owner at that point anymore. They took it and they they sunk a lot of money in it, and we started making Mad Maxes and AXDs and all of that stuff that I've already made in customs. Mm-hmm. They they had a way of doing it in production uh, through uh, they had some Hawes machining centers and things like that. So uh, that's how HTM got evolved into what it ended up being. And about about five or six years ago, I was. I don't want to say this. I don't want to sound disgruntled, but I was uh, concerned about my reputation because of the quality. Mm. Uh, so at that time, I backed out and I said, "I'm done." I, you know, uh, I'll help anybody that's been involved in, with these knives to this point if they need some help that I can help with. But other than that, I'm going my path and uh, sayonara. So. They actually went out of business after that, probably two or three years later. And um, that's exactly what happened with HTM, you know. And uh tell you the truth, I took a lot of flack over it. But you know what? Uh, I've learned that you just got to man up and, and, you know, things get tough. You just got to be tough with it. And uh, try to do the best you can and be an, as honest as you can. That's all you can do, you know, yeah. uh, and, you know, be the guy, you know. Never having actually um, laid hands on them, I I, I was uh, very excited to see whatever the new uh, knife was from that company in the back of uh, Blade Magazine or or, or uh, Knife Illustrated. And yes. I know you uh, they did some uh, Kirby Lambert design. Uh, and, yes, and yes. some other. De- I mean, so, some other designers. Uh, I'm not yeah, sure Greg how many. Lightfoot, other- Greg Lightfoot, Lightfoot. Kirby. Uh- Dirk Pinkerton. There was there was a few guys. I recruited those guys for them. Uh, that was part of the deal too. I needed to recruit guys that I saw thought had talent. Yeah, and uh, you know they took it from there. But you know I brought them through the door. That's why it was surprising for me to see it go away. I was like, someday I'm going to get all of those, <laughs> and then they're, yeah, and then they're gone. It, it was it was bittersweet, you know. Yeah. And you know it's like it's like. It's like being married. You got to be with the right person or it just don't work out correctly. And yeah. uh, that's basically what happened. That's the honest part of it. You know, Bob T was involved in it too. And he yeah. was on your interview here. We had a, a version, a couple of versions of his knives and he made some royalties on them and that kind of thing. But, you know, everybody tried really hard, but it just, there was some factors in there that were not foreseen. Let's just put it that way in the beginning. Uh, since that time, I brought out mid tech dominators, uh, and such like that so that I could try to stay in that, in that, uh, realm. And I decided that that point also, that was when I decided to let Kaiser do the, or not let them uh, to li- license the, uh, do- the, the gun hammer to them because I thought the gun hammer had more life hmm. and I didn't want to do it myself because then there would be too much 
too too it's too too many crossover points. So why not just uh, license it out, let them do a great job at it, and they let me have control over it and what what it ended up being. And I said that's good with me. And they're still going strong. So that's that seems like a great move, if, especially if you have. Um a stable of really excellent models, which you do, and and your shop is only outfitted to, I shouldn't say only, but your if your shop is outfitted to do one knife at a time, because these are complex mechanisms and complex uh, tools you're making here, it seems like a great idea for you to, to license out a design that's not really one that you're doing much anymore to a company like Kaiser or Riyadh or one of those uh, awesome you know Chinese manufacturers. To, sure. make, to make in your stead. I mean, that's a, I think that was a smart move. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. it, it, it has brought on some internet terrorism, but other than that, <laughs> wait, wait, that's, that's, that's a whole new thing. You know, uh, it's just, uh, there's a lot of internet, uh, uh, I guess you call them, uh, armchair warriors out there. And they all get, like you said about the opinions about this and about that. And, you know, what? it's just a new world. Uh, and you gotta be able to, you know, Get your get your battle gear on and get at it. You know yeah, that's man. all there's to it. I've also signed up a contract with Camillus, and I do maybe one knife a year with them now, and they've actually got a Dominator out. Uh, it's carbon fiber with titanium uh, lockside and S30B blade that they sell at Academy and Walmart and uh, really? four or five other places. Yeah, and they have the old EDC knife from the Camillus factory. They're still selling that knife like crazy. Is that the one that looks uh, like a like a Terzwool of ATCF, but it's got that weird mechanism on the side? No, no, that was uh, the Quick Flick. Or quick, was flick. quick Flick, something like that. I can't remember exactly. That the guy that invented that invented that. You do you uh, do you know what the uh, the way the uh, stamps are? The automatic stamps where you push them down, they go back up in. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at that mechanism, it's exactly the same the way he did that on the side to make that blade do that. It's up and down. It's kind of crazy. You have to you have to know him. He's he's, <laughs> he's a pretty cool guy. That knife sold like crazy too. The dot the knife that they had EDC wise, it was a nice little stainless frame lock, and it had pierced side plates with to lighten it all up. And it was very small. It was only a three inch blade. And we, we won best of the year or something at Blade Show 2002 or something. I can't remember when, but it was the best knife of the year or something. And once Camillus got sold, uh, all of that intellectual property got sold to Acme United, which is still Camillus, but Acme United is the parent company and they own all kinds of stuff. But they took those designs and revamped them and brought them back out. And they were they were very kind to me and very generous to me and they they didn't have to pay me a royalty but they do anyway just to show that they're on the up and up hmm. and uh last year at the shot show they brought out the dominator and they're selling it all over the place oh what i some of the big box stores are that i don't even like some of them i don't even know where they're at hmm. but it's very unique i walked into walmart one day and i called called the, the fellow up there i said Man, I didn't know you guys were selling this knife. He goes, "Oh yeah, that check you get—that's what it's from." <laughs> so, okay, I'm going to buy one. <laughs> well, I, I had actually had no idea about that. I gotta, I gotta check that out. That that might be my entree into the DDR world. Speaking of which, uh, where do you see where is DDR headed? I know you're you're you have a new run coming out and uh, of AXDs, I believe you said, and, and AODs. Yes, yes. Describe describe those knives briefly, and then tell me what else you're you're looking at in the future, say down the road a little bit. The AOD is coming up next. We have some orders to fill, and then we're going to make some spec knives also. And then we have a large client. That knife has a following by itself that I didn't even realize how strong it was. That was one of Charlie Mike's other knives that he said I could never make that lock move on that knife. In other words, he could flick it, he could bang it, he could do anything, and that lock would open and stay right where it did all the time he measured it and the, all of these guys out there could make that knife make that knife well i'm going to make the knife we have some orders we're going to go ahead and make that knife it had a it had an iconic uh deal about the lock on it and it's very beefy and i i thought man it's so heavy but these guys there's guys out there that want that uh so that's next then the expendables knife again in several different uh varieties but we're changing it to have a bearing pivot 
It'll have a steel lock insert. It'll have a solid titanium backspacer and a solid titanium clip on this version coming out. After that, I've got an out the front that I'm going to be bringing out. Ooh, you don't say. <laughs> yep, that's uh, well, that's the next three. Um, uh, I've got some fixed blades in the field right now that are doing very, very well. Also, they're very, they're they're built similar to a tops knife. Uh, mm -hmm. they're made for folks that want to buy anything from say 200 bucks under that. They're all American made, American sheaths, American. They're excellent. They're done fantastic. They're all powder coated. They're all, uh, 87, uh, 8740, I believe it is, uh, high alloy carbon steel. And they're made for going out in the field and just beating the living daylights out of stuff. That, that knife line, uh, sells in different venues than we're generally used to in, uh, the Instagram and, Facebook crowds. Uh, it's more folks that use them every day and they buy them at gun stores and that, that sort of thing all over the, the, the country. Are those under the DDR label? What, what are those uh, they're actually uh, DGT. DGT. Uh, it's called DGT gear. And uh, we've got them into the military. We've got them, you know, all different kinds of places. Um, the other thing I'm working on right now is uh, a, fr a good friend of mine. His name is LC Dunwoody. And he's a he's a good German boy. So him and I have been hanging out together since uh well since God was a baby. <laughs> and uh uh we hooked back up about five years ago. We kinda lost track of each other when I moved to Texas. And he flew down here and we went fishing and uh over here at the lake and caught a bunch of stripers. Hmm. Anyway, so uh uh since that time him and I he he owns an aerospace shop up in uh Columbus, Ohio. They have, I think, 24 spindles up there, CNC spindles, and they make everything from rocket motors to uh, turbine gear for some of the craziest looking things I've ever seen in my life for generators where they drop a generator into the Philippines and it lights up a city. Oh, man. He makes some crazy, crazy, crazy stuff that I'm just, I love it because that's just, to me, that's just like everyday stuff. But him and I... Uh, got some things going in the fire also uh we're, we're doing gun grips we're doing some uh gun parts we're also making some tools for the gun industry for cleaning and uh field use and things of that sort so we have some other things going on there and then uh maybe a couple other little projects that will come to fruition here in the next couple of months but he's a fantastic vision he's very he's a vision guy he's a maven yeah he's out there every day just knocking it down so that's uh another part of what's coming up next and what's coming up next uh pens i'm going to be making a bolt pen pretty soon uh cool you know i've waited all this time and i've stayed out of that market long enough uh i gave them guys their due for coming up and doing that now uh, i feel it's uh that you know it's time i, I move into that market and and uh, make a bolt pen and, you know, a couple of new pens, that kind of thing. My pens are just fantastic. We, we do a good job on them. They're, they're all handmade here. I make them. I've got a lathe out there. We make them with a uh, seven-axis lathe, and we make those on there. We make them all here, or they're, uh, uh, Elsie does some work on them, too, for me. He does some uh, uh, rough drilling and that kind of thing. Well, that's exciting to me because I, I have a real latent uh, pen fetish uh, that I have yet to really explore. You know, I have an old <laughs> and, yeah, and I have a hinderer investigator, but I'm like, I look at these pens and I'm like, oh, this is another, uh, a whole nother rabbit hole for me to go down. <laughs> I do have one story I've got to tell about my wife. Uh, she does all of our shipping logistics and things like that. And a lot of customer support, that kind of thing. So we were making some Mokotai pens. I was buying bars of Mokotai from Chad Nichols and we were making these beautiful Mokotai pens and they were going for about anywhere from five to 700 bucks because of the material is 35 bucks an inch. So Ooh. you can imagine, then you've got to do all that work. You've messed something up. You got all that, you know, all that kind of thing. So anyway, uh, we, we had made a run of them. We had two extra pens and one of them disappeared and I didn't know what happened to it. So she still has that pen on her desk and nobody touches it. And that's her pen. <laughs> My wife writes with a $500 mocha tie pen that we make here. So, Hey man, that's, that's a, that's a classy lady. Yeah. And I'll <laughs> never get it back either. I'll, you know, I'll, lose, I'll lose a finger if I even try. Well, Daryl Ralph, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Tell everybody how people can get in touch with your knives, get 
get into one of your knives or what, what's where are the best places to to find you and to purchase your your uh, your product just go to darrellrauf.com i had a website done about 6 months ago with a genius guy everything you want to order on a knife you can see the picture and click it so you can click the backspace or you can click the clip you can do this clip that clip that and it's it's full blown and you can do it on any knife you want to or we have knives up there once in a while. We do a spec knife, and I'll throw it up there for sale. Uh, you can get it there. You can get a hold of me uh, on Instagram. You can get a hold of me on Facebook. You can call my cell phone. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an available guy. I'm not one of these guys that hides in a rabbit hole. <laughs> and I'm around most of the time. You can text me. You can do whatever you want. I, I, I work all day, and then I work half the night, too, designing stuff like that, getting ready for the next day. So that or just call our shop it's right on the website you can just call anytime we're here and you know we take care of all of our old knives also if anything if there's any way possible to uh do the customer service and repair on anything we do it we try to keep a few parts of this and a few parts of that to make sure that we can take care of our customers and make sure they have great customer service so that's that's the best way to get a hold of me or just call my uh the 469-728-7242. <laughs> that's our phone. <laughs> and I I'm here to tell you your new website is awesome. I was uh you know doing research for the show and uh kind of designing designing my own knives and then of course I had to close the window sadly. Thank you so much uh Daryl for coming on the show. It's it's been a real honor speaking with you and uh finally uh, uh you know a pleasure to finally uh Get in, get slightly into the mind of the man behind the knives. Bob, it's been a, it's a great honor, man. Uh, and I love that, love your interview with Bob Trezola. Oh, he's thank such you. a character, man. What he's an cool icon. You know, he really, really, really did make a lot of inroads into this business. He did. He changed things. He he was a game changer. <laughs> and you know, and uh, great respect, great respect. As are you in your way, sir. Thank you much, sir. Subscribe to the Knife Junkies YouTube channel at the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube. We're back on the Knife Junkie podcast. Jim Person along with Bob, the Knife Junkie, DeMarco, and Bob, uh, Daryl Ralph. Uh, man, what a great interview. Yeah, great interview, great guy. And uh, I, I'm really loving his knives. Um, Want to get my hand on that on that uh, Mad Max. Uh, I, I got to say, Jim, uh, these interviews, um, a, a common theme keeps uh, emerging, at least for me. I'm, I'm fascinated with how... These knife heroes of mine are are how they've built their career. That's why I ask so many questions about the past and how they got to where they are. Because it's very interesting to me to see that you don't just start at the top. You don't just start with a highly polished knife and a good reputation. You got to build that over the years. And and uh, something Daryl talked. We didn't really talk much about it, but he he got his start in Ohio, uh, as did I. And uh, and then at some point he decided to break out and make a clean, fresh start. And he, he headed west, head west, young man. And he went out to Texas and he started his, uh, he restarted his company out there. And he's got a small outfit with some dedicated young people working for him. And uh, he's got the, a great situation worked out where he can, he can cycle out knives design by design and do different production runs and grow his small business uh, while maintaining kind of a high profile. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that that's inspirational to me. Well, the thing that I uh, I really liked when he said it was, and I'm paraphrasing here, he can learn from the young people working in his shop while he's teaching them the craft of knife making that he's learned over so many years. So I, I found that that recognition on his part, you know, just just really interesting. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and we've heard that before. That's a common theme. Greg Lightfoot had had similar things to say about working with the next generation. And it's funny, um, out there in the in the regular business world, you hear a lot of people griping about the millennials. And I'm sure there's plenty to gripe about. Every generation has something to gripe about the next generation. But everything I'm hearing from these knife makers are there are some really, really excellent young people coming up through the ranks, willing to learn and willing to add their own perspectives as young knife designers and knife collectors. And I, mm. I, I think it's cool. It's like a like I said, circle of life before joking about getting Epic Snuggle Bunny's knife, but it is keeping the, the thing going and keeping right. the, the knife trade going into the future. 
Want to remind you that episode 49 of the Knife Junkie podcast can be found at theknifejunkie.com slash 49. And remind you that our podcast today is brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial just by going to audibletrial.com slash knifejunkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, MP3 player. Again, just go to audibletrial.com slash knifejunkie. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial. I just want to say one more thing, Jim. I just want to thank everybody for watching the collection selection videos on YouTube and commenting. I'm getting some, I'm having some very interesting uh, uh, interactions with the people who are watching. Thank you for listening to the podcast, showing interest in this. Um, it's just been an excellent experience so far. And uh, I, I just want to say thanks. Well, and if you want to uh, uh, see some of those videos that Bob is talking about, the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that little bell icon so that you'll uh, not only be subscribed, but you'll get notified anytime the Knife Junkie comes out with a new video. And right now it's it's every single day. So we'll see how long that streak continues. But hey, the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube for those videos. You'll find everything at the knifejunkie.com. That's uh, Instagram, Facebook page, uh, the videos, podcast, etc. So we encourage you to visit there and follow along with the Knife Junkie's journey. For Bob, the Knife Junkie, DeMarco, I'm Jim Person, thanking you for listening to episode 49 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.